Welcome to the Attic Monologues. Episode 9, I Think Upon Hellfire. Debatable. I'll call that later. No, no, no. I'm awake. What's up? What time is it anyway? It's 9am. Ollie, why is it 9am? I've been awake since 6. Of course you have. Some of us like to sleep. Some of us were up very late last night. I know. You called me last night. I did? Well, Bella called me to talk to you so she could go and have a shower and stop babysitting you. (laughs) It was pretty funny. Please tell me Mum wasn't awake. No, she was asleep. Don't worry, you didn't do anything weird. Well, weird for you, anyway. I mean, you said a lot about Bella, but... What did I say? Nothing you haven't said before. I like her so much, Ollie. I'm so bad at feelings. I just wish I could tell her how I feel. I don't sound like that. You do sound like that. You sound exactly like that. Why did you have to wake me up this morning and choose violence? Haven't I suffered enough? You can suffer more. That sounds like a threat. Maybe it is. I don't like you. Yeah, you do. Normal people don't like their siblings. You're very famous for being normal. Listen. Hey, Nixie. How are you doing? Hey, Bells. Hey, Bella. Is that Ollie? Hi, Ollie. How are you doing? Good. I actually just got started on this volunteer project for an actual university physics department where we're categorising light curves from stars. That's basically just the measurement of a star's brightness over time. They take snapshots through telescopes and record it. It's so cool, especially looking at variable stars because they can have all kinds of shapes from their light curves, like the letter M or a zigzag, which means it was rotating and that's why the brightness changed. Holly, Ollie, bro, I, I love you, but I also need to go throw up. I'm going to hand over to Bella now, okay? Are they okay? Oh, yeah, you know. They're Nyx. A walking disaster, but they make it work. (laughs) Except when they don't. Yeah. How's school? How's your mum? Mum's in bed, I think. It's been a long week. And school is... Year 10, huh? Yeah. I just want to go to uni and do only one subject like you guys do. It looks so fun. You get to eat whenever you want and do whatever you want and I'd never have to write an English essay again. I'll try not to be offended. You guys, I've just realised an absolute travesty has occurred. Oh? We didn't make any Jared 19 jokes about Seth last night. Any what? Any what? Any what? he says, as if I'm not referring to a seminal piece of internet cultural history. What are they teaching kids these days? Rocket science. Ah, that'll explain it. Totally useless. How are you feeling? False alarm! I am fine. Looks like even a feeble gust of wind could knock you over right now. Don't be mean to me. I'm hungover. Mm, You're really mixing up your story here, Nixie. Mm, I'd like to go to bed forever now. Lola's making scrambled eggs and toast. Never mind. I am awake and ready for breakfast. (laughs) I thought you might be. You know me too well. You're just easy to bribe. Uh, So I'm going to hang up now. Yes, sorry. It was lovely to hear from you. I'm sorry for being a terrible sibling. I'll come over for dinner sometime next week. That would be nice. We've been eating cheese toasties most days this week. Right, I'm definitely coming over then. 
I can show off my stunning university cooking skills. I hope you like burnt vegetables. Hey, I'm not that bad. Ollie survived off my cooking for like four years and he isn't dead yet. Yet. Wow, okay. I'm going to hang up on you now instead. Go ahead. I will. Bye, Nixie. Love you. Love you too. Are you sure this is what you want to be doing with your Halloween afternoon? You don't have a choice anymore. I've started recording. Lola. Nix, Seth hasn't seen you perform one of these. It's a tragedy. At this point, I am very intrigued. When you hype it up, it's always going to be worse than expected. No fake humbling, Nixie. You're too nice to me. So, what's this one? More robots and sleeplessness? Robots and sleeplessness? It made sense in context. I'm sure. I've got two with me, so you get a choice. Ooh. I think they both have enough spooky vibes for Halloween, so the first one is about fire. Another one? Yeah, it seems to be a theme. I think they might be from the same plot. Well, if you've already done one of those, what's the other? It's also about fire, but it's also about mirrors. Terrifying. It is. I'll believe it when I see it. Well then, the character's name is Agatha Cochran, a very unlucky young woman. Okay, okay, I'm curious. You guys ready? Totally. When you're a kid, they tell you all sorts of superstitions, all sorts of lies. That you can't walk under ladders or step on cracks in the pavement or cross paths with black cats. That the world is black and white and you can't eat too many sweets and you have to be in bed before 10pm. Then you grow up a bit and you find out those were lies. The world won't crumble if you aren't careful. Your parents weren't saddling you up with useful life advice. Just scary stories to keep you in bed after dark to riddle you with anxieties and fears as if the world wasn't giving you enough of those already. So, you shake them off. Step on every crack in every road. Adopt a black cat and hide it in your room. Spend all your pocket money on sweets and eat them under your blanket at three in the morning. And it tastes like freedom, like the tight wind of your stomach finally coming undone. Then... Then you get a little older still. You're an adult and a runaway, and the rules are truly up to you. And within months, the novelty of true freedom's grown boring. You learn that, actually, yes, there is such thing as too many sweets. The world is as simple as kindness and cruelty, and you stumble into bed by 9pm. When you walk under a ladder, it rains for a week. The day you step on a crack in the pavement, you drop your favourite mug and it splinters. Just there. Just so. When you try to feed that secret black cat you never really learn how to care for, you come away bleeding and the scratches don't heal for weeks. It's a well-known fact that when you break a mirror, you invite seven years bad luck through your door. It's one of the more logical superstitions in my mind. A simple payment for simple destruction. You've ruined not just the mirror, but everything. Everything that graces it. The wall opposite where it sits. The girl who looks into it each morning to fix her makeup. The cat which slinks beside it in the dark. All of them broken. Ruined by the cracks you made in the glass. It's a simple payment. It's cheap, really. It's what you deserve. It was just a mistake. I didn't... I didn't mean to. I just... It was an accident. So many people say that, don't they? And sometimes they even mean it. But just because you believe something, does that make it true? How many times can you slip up before it's worked permanently into your bones? Before it's folded seamlessly into your character by those who know you? Oh, that's Agatha. She makes a lot of mistakes. 
Maybe that's just what I tell myself to sleep at night. Maybe I just wanted something to happen, anything at all, to change the script, the scene, the world. Maybe I would have done all of it on purpose, even if I knew just how much would chatter. I'm not being very clear, am I? Sorry, I'll, I'll start again, shall I? God, I can't even think where to start now. So much, so much has happened the past few years. That's always how it is, isn't it? Nothing for days, for years, and then just when you're begging for change, it all crumbles at once. I could begin with the day I met the Phoenix. I could begin with the first time I watched a house that we, we had set fire to. How we watched it burn. How it felt like the world was ending and beginning all at once. I could begin with the first time Val asked if she could kiss me. And the first time I said yes. But really, for me, I should begin with the first broken mirror. You never really think about what's inside a house when it burns. Sure, the people who own the house do, but when you're the one who set the fire, it's all just bricks and wood and mortar transmuting into ash. <laughs> I can almost hear you saying, but Agatha, I've never burnt down a house before. Normal people don't do things like that. And I suppose you're right. But you're in my shoes now, so just imagine that feeling you get when you've stared at a candle flame too long. That ache in your chest when you see the latest political tragedy on the news. If you could do something to change the world, wouldn't you? When you've looked at your life and known with awful certainty that you won't make it to 20, every day after is a double-edged sword for you to throw yourself on. They say you never forget your first. I don't think they're usually talking about burning houses, though. I'd seen, I'd seen fires before. Candles and cigarettes and bonfires on Guy Fawkes night. But this, this was different. Alive. It ate through the world quicker than we expected. It took us months to get it right, to realize we needed to stick together, to come out every time without the stink of wood smoke clinging to our clothes. But that first time, I didn't leave the house fast enough. So when the fire flooded the hallways, I was running alongside it. There was a mirror atop the hallway table, wide but short, propped up at the head height of an averagely tall person. I saw my reflection, soot smudged, lit by the flickering light of the fire gathering around me. I should have kept running. My hair was already smouldering, the support beams overhead creaking. But I stopped, and I watched the girl in the mirror. She was me, but not exactly. There was a scar on her cheek. Her hair was cut short. The house around her was different, whitewashed wallpaper curling in the heat. I saw the moment the fire reached the glass. I watched as the crack began to splinter through it, warping the girl in the mirror, tearing her in half. It spiderwebbed across my face, split the blaze of the fire into a thousand diamonds of light. And then Val was dragging me out of the flames, yelling at me, holding me tight in his arms, and the house collapsed into rubble. I couldn't hear it couldn't hear anything except the shattering of glass in my ears and I knew without doubt that the mirror lay under all that still reflecting still broken I I managed to forget for a while for years I ran away and lived a smouldering beautiful fever dream 
and then everything began to fall apart. It was after we lost... After we lost Ophelia. When the weight of the world... When reality began to bear back down on us. We were just kids, playing make-believe, imagining a world where anything we did mattered in the slightest. You can set a thousand fires and they just ignore the smoke and the heat, just build more buildings and write more lies. We got desperate. We got lazy. The next fire we set, we separated. There was a mirror in the hall, long and thin, taking in my entire figure in a single snapshot. The house was modern, minimalist, pale, but in the mirror I saw another Agatha, a few years and several hundred mistakes younger reflected in another hallway. Flower wallpaper and a glossy mahogany banister going up in flames. The cracks had spread through her since we last saw each other. Every part of her riddled with crawling, broken edges. I couldn't imagine how her body was still holding together. A single gust of wind should have shattered her. The past played out all over again. Val took me by the arm, just in time to avoid the roof caving in over our heads. They held me close, cursing me for being so reckless. They couldn't lose another person. They just couldn't. And I wished I could comfort her. I wished I could hug her back and tell her that I was okay, that I wasn't going anywhere. But I couldn't say anything. I couldn't think, couldn't breathe. All I could hear was the mirror fracturing in the blaze. It's been weeks and now, now everywhere I look, there are cracks. In the bathroom mirror each morning, there's spider webbed through paving stones, torn through advertisements and posters by the road, dividing each brick in every house I pass. And there are cracks too, in me. I see them in the mirror and can almost believe they run through the glass. I can almost believe that the fact that they move when I move is a simple trick of the light. But when I reach up to the mirror, the glass is smooth. When I look down at my skin, I find nothing there. But I feel it, all the same. An itch underneath as the fractures grow, as the inky darkness inside those cracks begins to bleed inside me. The mirror in the hallway. It wasn't the first, you see. The first I'd witnessed, sure, but I didn't know before that glass cracks under extreme temperatures if it's not done right. Every house every fire how many mirrors in each if my hand wasn't the one that broke it just the one that set the flame does all that luck hundreds and hundreds of years bad luck still transfer onto me I think so it makes sense don't you think all this bad luck piling up like it's our house we set ablaze. Like any moment the rubble will come crashing down on our heads and the girl I saw in the hallway mirror, the broken one, torn in two, that'll be me. Maybe that's what it was trying to show me. Maybe everything I know is coming could have been But there's no point in maybes, is there? We make our beds and we lie in them. And honestly, I'm not sure I would do anything different. I haven't told the others. 
I don't need to know that the end is coming or that I'm losing it. Either way, they can hardly change it. So I wait for the luck to catch up for my body to shatter into a thousand diamond shards. For all the damage I've done to find me and take me and maybe, just maybe, take only me. Maybe if I give myself over to be cursed, they'll be saved. God, I hope it's true. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was a good one. Less of a mood than the other one. More fantastical. But I liked it. So, is it an extract? It sounds like there's a ton of context missing. Uh, I don't know. They're all really mixed up in the chest, and I've only gotten around to reading some of them. Like Vela was saying, there was this other one about fire a while back, so maybe they're part of the same play? I haven't been able to find that one again, though. I think it might have ended up down the back of the sofa. And I haven't seen any other references to this other character, Val, or the Phoenix, whatever that is. You've read Harry Potter. Unfortunately, yes. But so much of these things is obviously metaphorical. No one would actually try putting a Phoenix on stage, unless it was for, like, a pantomime. Just because you had one bad experience with stage pyrotechnics doesn't mean they're... Oh, what, what what did you call them? I think it was the work of the devil. Oh, yeah, that was it. They are the work of the devil. Sure, they look pretty, they draw you in, but at the end of the day, you can always just use a fancy lighting state instead. Coward. Listen, you've never had to fill out a 20-page risk assessment. Because I'm smart. I game the system. I don't work backstage. It looks like so much work. That's half the fun. Only you would think being more stressed is fun. I mean, at least I didn't go to Oxford, so I can't enjoy stress that much. I would take that personally, except you're entirely right. See? Bella, back me up here. You live with them. Tell us about all the stress disasters. I plead the fifth. What does that even mean? <laughs> they say it on TV shows. American. TV shows. Those are the easiest to illegally download. Bella, is that a recorded confession of illegal activity I hear? You're still recording? You never know when even the most lovely and unassuming people can admit to heinous crimes. Quick, no one mentioned that murder from last summer. Hmm, well, we already have recorded evidence of the plastic murder sheets you keep in your room, Nixie. God, you're right. Guess I'd better utilise my half-one drama degree and assume a new identity and vanish. Never to be seen again. Anyone else for running away and living in a cave in a far-flung distant country with me? With excellent Wi-Fi and running water, of course? Please, I'm begging you guys. Give me some context. No, I don't think we will. <laughs> but it's my birthday. Mmm, that was yesterday. Now you're just an old man hanging out with the younger generation to try to feel cool again. I'm the coolest person in this house. And also the one paying for your pizza this evening. Please, God, not more pizza. I can't handle any more of your monstrosities. The pineapple, anchovies, hot sauce, chocolate sprinkles was a step too far. You guys just have no taste. I'm surprised you can taste anything with taste buds that rewired. Anyway, what movie do we want to watch first? Avoidance of the Statement, Your Honour. Over the Garden Wall? And you're aiding and abetting. Let's watch Over the Garden Wall. Technically not a movie. It's 110 minutes. That's a movie. By definition? We are not having this argument again. I'm putting it on. I'll grab the sweets. I'll grab the drinks. I'll grab... Actually, I'll just sit here and be the ringleader. Remember to turn off your voice notes. Those things take up way more storage than you think. Oh yeah, thanks. Don't want to record any more of Bella's illicit confessions. Ooh, and I was so ready to tell you all about that time I robbed the diamond vault.
Thank you for listening to The Attic Monologues. Today's episode was written and produced by Morgan Greensmith. It was directed and script edited by L.M. Cluhessi. The sound design was by Anna Leclerc, and the theme tune was composed by Wilkie Morrison. In this episode, you heard the voices of... Alex Abrahams as Ollie Ryland. Atlas Morgan as Nix Ryland. Anne Lorian as Bella Crow. Roya Garby as Lola Brodeur. Ben Tallison as Seth Endham. The logo was designed by Ailey Lang. The social media is run by Soren Briarwood. Find us on Twitter at Attic Monologues and on Tumblr, Instagram and Facebook at The Attic Monologues. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider sending us some love through our Ko-fi. You can find us at www.co-fi.com slash The Attic Monologues. Or maybe just leave a rating or review. Or you could even tell a friend you think might enjoy oblivious romantics, creeping fantasy elements and existential crises to listen. Any comments or questions, shoot us a message over our socials or email us at theatticmonologues at gmail.com. Again, from all of our team, thank you so much for listening. Episode 10, Yours Sincerely, will be out on December 29th. See you then! Which flavour popcorn? Uh, sweet and salty? Best of both worlds? Correct answer. Are you okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why wouldn't I be? Nix might have... Oh. Yeah. It's... I'm handling it. You don't need to be the stable one, you know. Trust me. I'm not. You're pretending to be, and that's worse. Remember to look after yourself, please. You sound just like Nick's. Well, maybe this time they're right. Yeah. My house is always open, if you need. Or if you want. You guys are always forgetting the world outside exists. (sighs) That's true enough. So... My house, just you and me. Next weekend, no arguing. We'll paint our nails, watch the craft, drink spiked hot chocolate. The whole self-care package. What about the others? What about them? You need a break from them too. Yes, even Nick's. I love them, but 24-7? I couldn't handle anyone 24-7. Maybe you're right. Of course I am. I'm always right. Besides, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Really? Or so I've heard. I'll come over. But no relationship talk. Just you and me. Oh, you're killing my vibe. Okay, okay. No relationship talk. Just you and me and some cult classics. Sounds perfect. Um, I think he burnt the popcorn. diary. Today the mean man with the glasses gave me a lobotomy. Could you please take this seriously? This is a scientific recording device. I take it you're familiar with the guidelines of your sentence, seeing as you agreed to come here of your own volition. That's a pretty generous term. Well, point being, you are here now, and I don't believe your feelings have much of an effect on your situation. You took the deal. You transferred to Nemesine. What's done is done. Hello, police. Where should I commit a crime? Could you direct me to a good place to rob, please? Given the lack of successes in this area from my predecessor, Dr. Dent, and the fact that we don't have access to any of the pre-existing research in this field- Because we're working in a space prison. Because we're working in a space prison. I'm not expecting any major breakthroughs. Amazon, coming to all podcast streaming platforms on July 17th. Remember where you are.